In this year of change in the voting process, one of the statewide ballot questions will open the door to a new way of deciding elections. If approved, the winners of state and local races could be determined by ranked choice voting. Supporters say it's a better way to produce outcomes with broad support, but opponents say there could also be more voter confusion or even disengagement. A webinar about the pros and cons is being presented tomorrow by the Pioneer Institute. To tell us about it as a moderator as well as producer and host of the Institute's podcast, Hop Wonk. We'd like to welcome Joe Salvaggi. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Joe. Chris, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Joe, I, I know there are some people who have uh, looked at this, maybe they've even voted on it already, but for people who are not there yet, uh, how does ranked choice voting work? Well, Chris, um, there's quite a bit of money and a, a dedication to helping voters understand what it is. In a nutshell, uh, our current voting system is where one person uh, gets one choice for each uh, elected office, and the person with the most vo votes, whether that's a majority, that's 50% plus one, or a plurality, which is perhaps 23%, uh, that person, as it stands now, wins the election. In ranked choice voting, we're given more than one choice. We're given our preference, our first choice, uh, but we're also uh, asked to give a second, third, fourth choice if there's several people on the ballot. Uh, the logic being that by, by so doing, you're capturing more than just a single preference in a binary world or uh, you know, where, where your number one preference is, but you're also capturing the nuances of uh, what your second or third preferences are uh, with the hope of understanding what voters want better. Right. Well, I'm going to start by, by putting this in the best possible light, because if you have a crowded field, uh, it, it, it's very conceivable that a, a fringe candidate with very limited appeal could end up the winner. And a lot of people would be dissatisfied with that. So I guess, isn't that how ranked choice voting could at least make more people feel satisfied with the outcome? Well, I, I'd say um, to, to your point, I think you make two points in your question, but to the more, uh, the, to the first one you addressed, uh, fringe candidates actually will perhaps get more attention. Uh, there is an incentive baked into ranked choice for the leading candidates to in effect, fight nice with all uh, other uh, candidates. So uh, you want to get everyone's first choice, but of course you'd like to get everyone's second choice. So you will not um, criticize or perhaps marginalize fringe candidates. In fact, you may uh, bring them into your tent with the hope of being those supporters' second choice. Uh, so I think it does give a voice to fringe candidates. I think the, the odds that a fringe candidate would win are actually fairly remote. Remember, Ranked choice voting really only comes into play if no one gets 50% plus one. Uh, and that's you know, not often the case. Uh, they, uh, I'll, I don't know if it's an obscure reference, but in, in Australia, they uh, practice ranked choice voting and they discover that uh, in that case, 90% of the time, the person with the most votes in the first round wins. So this will overcome or uh, overturn those outcomes in 10%, or if we follow uh, Australia's lead, uh, in which case that 10% is unlikely to be the fringe candidate, but rather uh, perhaps a, an aggregation of uh, a broad consensus on the other side. Well, uh, to try another example of ranked choice voting, more controversial, you had a race for a seat in Congress in Maine, and the per person who got the most first choice votes did not win. Some people had a problem with that. I think uh, one of them is uh, going to be taking part in this webinar tomorrow. Can you tell us about that example? Sure, our webinar is hoping to uh, understand the merits of both sides. I, I enjoy this format in that, in theory, I don't have a, a horse in the race. I'm, I'm trying to be the, a, a jurist rather than an advocate. Uh, but uh, in the case, uh, in a real world case, uh, Maine did adopt ranked choice voting, and it did, in this case, overturn uh, the outcome of the election. Bruce Polquin was, uh, got the most votes in the first round. Uh, and then in the instant runoff election, which is essentially a electronic rerun of the race where you, you remove the candidate with the fewest votes and reapportion their second choices to the other candidates. And the, the candidate in second, second place on the first round actually became uh, the winner. So there's, uh, if you're Bruce Polkman, you don't like the outcome. Uh, but if you're a, a, a voter who says, look, uh, this is the way uh, elections go, the, uh, the person with the most votes wins, uh, uh, then, you know, the simplicity of that you, you can embrace. What I will say to uh, uh, Bruce Polkman's uh, credit is that uh, it does provide some level of confusion where a system other than the person with the most votes in the first round wins does create, in a sense, 
uh, a feeling that perhaps an election may have been stolen or an outcome, a less desirable outcome was achieved. Well, of course, part of the process here in the controversy is uh, which votes actually count, because once you get beyond the first round, you're, you're also discarding some votes because none of them went to the surviving candidates. So there are some people saying, well, uh, you know, the, the winner ends up with something that's really less than 50 plus 1 percent. Isn't that possible? There's uh, two elements to what you describe. In, in fact, you're right. There are... Um, votes that aren't counted in, in ranked choice voting. Uh, in the first round, everybody's first round is counted. Uh, on the second round, um, after we've eliminated one of the candidates, in theory, if every single voter voted and ranked properly every single candidate, no votes would be lost. And in fact, what happens at the end would be indeed a, a, um, a majority. But because so many votes are eliminated, that is to say some people will vote, even though they could vote for four people, they vote for one person. After that first round, their, their vote may be eliminated. And so ultimately, the person who wins with a majority is winning a majority of a ma manufactured um, electorate, meaning you're no longer uh, counting all the votes that were given on election day, but rather a subset of those votes that had not yet been el eliminated by the second, third, or fourth round. So you're getting a majority of something other than those people who showed up on election day. So there, there's, there's that. Um, well, this is an alternative that provides for more complexity, but it's not mandatory complexity. If you don't want to pick additional people, then you don't have to. So is this complexity really a deterrent to voter participation? I mean, have we seen anything that really proves that so far? Well, I, I, I don't want to spoil the surprise. I hope uh, your listeners join us for the uh, webinar. I've seen data on both sides. I've seen it in some ways that the complexity of ranked choice voting suppresses voters. In other words, because they can't understand all five candidates' positions and then feel confident in their ability to rank them properly, uh, they may just stay home. Uh, but on the other side, uh, if more people are considered viable, it may encourage uh, people to show up to vote for their um, uh, long shot candidate and then provide their second choice at the candidate. So a case could be made in both cases. Uh, what I'd say is the common thread uh, for all the advocates is uh, they're perhaps like you and me, Chris. They're people who are who uh, rep, you know, dive into facts, understand candidates, want to know the nuances of every uh, political candidacy and every political uh, debate. Uh, but most people don't approach politics that way. They're they're involved in uh, very complex lives, and they then they dedicate some of their time to to, to, to politics and, and to voting. And I think for those people, um, they're happy to know one candidate as their, as their preference. The idea that they'd be able to in, in, rank five candidates in an informed way, uh, really, I think, um, uh, it, it, it challenges credulity. Well, one of the other things that people might want to know about is the financial backing around this question on either side. There's a lot more money in favor of it, uh, and people might be wondering, where is that money coming from? What does it represent? C c have you been able to distinguish anything on, on those? When I first heard about ranked choice voting, it was uh, uh, one of my, uh, uh, the, the, the smartest professors I know at Harvard Business School, Michael Porter, did a big presentation uh, on the merits of ranked choice voting. I thought, well, if Michael Porter likes it, so must I. Uh, but I, I looked a little further and, and there's some substantial backing both at the business school for Michael Porter and for this issue coming from uh, very large billionaire level donors in the Midwest. I think uh, it's not coming from inside the state, though there are many uh, 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 good voices for ranked choice voting in the state, but it is a national campaign. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, as much as I've studied it, is not the panacea. It's not our, the answer to our, uh, to our uh, very, very contentious, uh, polarized uh, political landscape. I, I wish it were. If it were, I, I'd, I'd, join the, I'd, I'd get off the fence and, and join the pro ranked choice voting team. Uh, I also want to ask you about your, your podcast, because uh, this is a, a different uh, venture for the Pioneer Institute right now. Uh, um, what's your formula for doing this generally? Well, I'd say Pioneer is a, a wonderful think tank. It's a, a free market uh, think tank here in Boston. They produce wonderful uh, research, uh, many white papers, 25, 50 page long white papers. My thesis is not everyone has the time or the interest in reading a white paper. They want to understand complex ideas in the kind of situation that you and I are enjoying right now. 
conversation goes a long way to helping people break down complexity and understand the essence of, of an issue. So when I talked to Jim Sturgis, the uh, executive director of Pioneer, I said, look, your, your research is a mile wide and a mile deep. It's very valuable, but not everyone is, is going to be able to access it. So the Pioneer, uh, the Hubwonk podcast is a way to communicate uh, the research of Pioneer and also adjacent research, things that are very similar to uh, Pioneer's research that may not get the attention. Uh, it's a way to communicate with with uh, listeners uh, about Pioneer's research and other research like it. We should mention that if people want to catch uh, the podcast or the webinar, what's the best way to do that? Well, you can go to the Pioneer uh, website, pioneerinstitute.org, uh, and look under um, uh, multimedia. You'll find it there. The name of the, the search or the uh, podcast is Hubwonk, H-U-B-W-O-N-K. You can go to iTunes and subscribe. It downloads every... Uh, uh, Tuesday at 11, which I think was in, uh, 15 minutes ago per this. Um, so uh, we cover everything from national topics, for instance, the Supreme Court vacancy, to uh, most recently we talked about the uh, Boston project, the I-90 Austin project, the proverbial throat uh, issue uh, that's coming up. So we, we cover big topics, national topics often, but often we are doing uh, the grassroots uh, understanding what's going to be a very a big and uh, impactful project here right in Boston. So. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. It's my pleasure, Chris. Uh, good luck with your show. All right, thank you. That was Joe Salvaggi from the Hubwonk Podcast at the Pioneer Institute. We'll have more news in just a moment.